press comments and so on. Also, Noam uh, has two days ago uh, has talked with Kent Beck, yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, the author of uh, TDD and uh, TDD and clean tests. So you uh, have the opportunity to hear maybe what Ken Beck have told to, uh, has told to Vix. Now I'm represented Vix Solutions. It is a new company in Kiev, and uh, they have a lot of positive feedbacks. So I think in some day we can organize junk meeting in, uh, in, in Vix office. Yeah. Okay. So I give the word to Noam. And uh, thank you. Good luck. Uh, everybody can hear me? Or let's okay. Uh, today we're gonna talk about oh today we're gonna talk about clean tests. Um, uh, this is me. I'm Noam. I've been working at Wix for the last four years. Um, I build a I build a few systems uh, in Wix and Actually, like uh, I wrote a lot of tests. I, I never, I actually didn't write any tests before I got to Wix, and uh, it kind of grew on me. And um, just like a, a small comment that I can give is that uh, we had a hackathon, and one of the guys developed a grep tool over our Git repo, and apparently I'm the number two contributor of all tests on, in our repo. So apparently I, d I wrote some tests, but. Um, Today, um, I'm going to try to share some of the things that I learned and tried along the way. Um, some of them are applicable, some of them are less applicable, but you should... Uh, and I, I can only say that in, in a lot of cases, I keep on growing and learning, although in the last, I think, a year, I don't think I changed a lot in um, my mythologies, but I hope I can share some of that information with you and save you some time. Um, what are we gonna do today? Uh, today, we're gonna, I'm gonna give a, sh a short intro. Uh, I'm gonna uh, review some of the things about test structures that some of you probably already practice. Uh, and then we're gonna drill down to those sections and start and, and we'll refactor a test that I wrote specifically for this talk. And we have a lot of, uh, we have, I think, an hour, even a little bit more. So feel free to ask questions and uh, comment and contribute to anything I, I offer. Um, so let's start with uh, a very simple question. Why, why should we do that? Like, uh, it, it, some, you know, a, a short question, uh, a short question. Who, how many Java developers are here? Most of you. Uh, Scala? Okay. <laughs> Power. <laughs> JavaScript or uh, Node? Also a few. Um, some, some of the samples I'm going to give are in, in Specs 2, which is in Scala, but most of the things are applicable in, in Java, even though I can say it's a little bit less nicer. <laughs> but, uh, well, I have a Scala friend here, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so why should we clean? Why should we start clean the code or clean the test? First of all, I can, I can assure that the last thing being deleted out of a co code is the test. Usually you, you start stop using it, the test keeps there, and then in the end you delete the test. So product, test code, you, you, you live with test code more, more than you live with production code. The production code can actually change. If you wrote your test good enough and you decide that the implementation is not good, you can actually write another implementation have, and have the same tests work on it. So you, tests actually need more attention than the production code. Another thing is that there are a lot more tests than code. That uh, in some, some people are very fanatic, uh, have I think one to 10. So for each line of code, they have 10 line of tests. I actually, I, it's, for me, it's like 60, 40%, but you have a lot more code. And when you have a lot more code, the structure and the, the, the order, it's, it's, it's much more important. The more code you have, the more you need to invest in it. If you have like five lines of code, well, 
that's nothing. But when it goes to 1,000 and 2,000 and even more, then the tests are there to help you. Um, another thing is uh, that we, every feature that we add to the system, we keep running the tests over and over again. So if you're adding more features and the tests fail, then you have to read them and understand why they failed. So basically, even if you wrote them once while you were coding, later on they will, they will keep, uh, and people would keep reading them and running them and start and start and try to understand them and try to figure out why they failed. So if, they, if you added something and suddenly some test in other uh, section of the system fail, you need to, uh, I don't know, try to find out why it failed. So you read it more and more. Like I have, I, I, I think I have like in my career uh, one time where we had a big set of tests and uh, suddenly uh, one of the tests failed and I had to actually understand why it failed and I think it took me like almost like three or four days till the point where I got to understand that the test wasn't running at all. <laughs> it was... Uh, Apparently it was working, but it, it was testing something and for some reason it was passing and then something changed in the system that maybe changed the latency in like two or three milliseconds and then it, start, it stopped working. And then I had to spend like three or four days to understand why it stopped failing. And so I had to read a lot of those things to understand them. And later on I had to, well back in the day I had QA people in Wix currently, we don't have QA people. Um, so uh, I had to actually explain why it wasn't, why this test is not significant. He was keep emailing me saying, like, what, what, why, why is it failing now after you added that feature? And so, like I said, you, when you have tests, you have to, uh, and when tests fail, uh, tail, and when tests are written properly, you won't hit those issues. Um, I can quote some people smarter than me, <laughs> uh, like Uncle, Uncle Bob that actually mentions that tests are even more important because if your tests are, are badly written and they stopped uh, and, and you cannot maintain them and cannot work with them, then when you add new feature, then you have to invest a lot of time to make all of them pass. So at some stage, the code just don't let you, it won't let you add more features because it's very, it, so if the tests are, are, are not working, then, then the code, the, the system will not grow anymore because you keep on, you keep have to go back to the code and try to understand why, why I added this line of code and tests in other section of the system stopped working and, and the time for each feature goes from one day to two days and then three days and then a week and then three weeks and then when people ask for new feature, you just tell them, well, we cannot add this because we cannot contain it. So it's very, very important to do that. But so next slide is what is good? Well, like, I, I can go in here because I'm on this stage and tell you, well, I know what good is, but there is no good. It's like some things that we can do are very good in some area and very bad in other area. But we can always measure what is good by, by asking questions, like how easy to extend stuff. I want to add a new, a new feature to the system. I want to introduce it. Will it take me one day or a week or a month or a year? And if it's very easy to keep extending the system and adding more and more features, then the design is good. It's good for us. If, if it's the other way around, so if, and, and by the way, I'm not talking about, like people can say, well, I have this system that I wrote, uh, I don't know, a year ago, and it's working in production, and the tests are not, I don't even have tests. I, I'm, it's just working and everything is good, so what do you want from me? But I'm talking about systems, first of all, that are alive more than a year. It's not like a small project, so you keep on maintaining them and adding more and more stuff. And the system themselves are growing. So if you have something that's not being modified or not being extended, then it's not very interesting. But if your system keep on growing and you need to add more and more features to it, then you have to, uh, ask this, that question. Uh, another thing is when it breaks, something breaks, something always breaks. This is what we do. We break stuff and then we fix them. We try to add more stuff and then something else breaks and we need to understand why it broke and then, then we have to fix it again. So if something breaks, if the system breaks, for, for example, the, the example that I gave earlier, 
something broke in the system and I had to spend like three or four days just to understand why it broke. That's definitely not a good system design. You want to, if something breaks, you need to have someone. Well, in each company, there is a guru that go, you, you go and tell them like, why is this and that broke? And he goes like, oh, just write that specific line and then everything is, is working and that guy is very, very important in the company. But <laughs> if you write good software, then you don't have to have just one guy. It's you, it's everybody around you. Everybody can look at the test and understand, well, this is not working because you changed this and it's very simple. So this is one of the measurements that you can apply on your system when you actually want to, to validate if your design or your tests or everything is working properly. Another thing is when a system is bad, and I guess everyone uh, actually did that, is how many people say like, oh, we have to rewrite that system. That system is crap. Ah, oh, we can't touch this anymore. It's, it's awful. Yeah, we have to rewrite it. So if your system getting all the time, people are saying like, we have to rewrite it. We have to rewrite it. You did something wrong. <laughs> so this is, and, and if, if you see the, the image that I chose is, is like bad and good, bad and good is, is it's very, it's sometimes it's very near each other. It's like you can do something that it's very, very good in, in one system and then apply it in another uh, solution and that solution is awful and people have to spend like hours to fix it. So sometimes you think you did something good, but then it's bad. So this is why we ask those questions and try to uh, understand <laughs> how, how good is our design and then we keep on repairing and adding more stuff. Uh, so uh, let's talk about test structure. Well, everybody, uh, how many people here write tests? Oh, that's a, that's a great, how many practice like TDD? I'm not, okay, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> um, so a test structure. Test structure is, I'm, I'm talking about the structure of the test, how it looks. Uh, it's a map to your code. So we want it to be as clear as possible. And uh, why is it so important that the structure would be predictable? Is because if you know, if you have like a, a guideline of how the, how, what, you what you should expect in each area and what, you should, what, you, what should happen in each area. For example, I can give the, the simplest example. The, when you have a function that has a side effect, that's a bad thing, everybody knows it's a bad thing. But why is it bad? Because it does something that you didn't expect. And you don't want to have any surprises. So if you have a code that someone looks at it and goes like, okay, this does this, this does that, and this does something else. So people know the structure and then now they know that if something broke in the database, then they have to go to the layer that updates the database. So it's easier for them. So a map is, is very good as a description of, of what we do in a test. And a map reveals only the right amount of details in each area. For example, if you, I, I took a, a Google map and you know that if you go in Google map and zoom in, then the street, you have more names on the streets and, more na and you see more roads that you didn't see in the higher version. And this is how I look at, uh, at a single test. You, you look at a test, you see just the right amount of details that you need to see in that specific scope. And if you want to understand more, well, I want to understand how exactly it does this, I will drill down into the code. So if you write a predictable, uh, a predictable structure and then you, and you reveal the right amount, then uh, it's very easy for people to just go into your code gradually. They don't want to see, if you have a map that shows you like everything at the same time, then you get confused because you got too much detail. Another thing is, and I wrote a, a, a I did like a, a marking that it should be consistent. I, I know that this specific requirement is a little bit difficult because systems are being maintained by different people and different times. But if you go to a system that works in, a, in, a, in the same way and then you go like, no, I'm, I'm smarter than that guy. He was, I don't know why, what he did. And, and I'm gonna do a whole different thing than somebody who will go to that test structure or any code uh, and see this is the way they did this until this guy and then he went away and then another guy did something else and then another guy did something else and the older the system gets 
the more unpredictable it gets when it comes to, to how the code is written. So my, uh, my personal advice is if someone does something in the system, try to understand at least why he did it and try to migrate to a different version of, of the code, a different style in a way that wouldn't confuse other readers. Because we write code and then other people are, are forced to read it and repair it and, and, and fix it later on. So, well, be considerate. And like I said, it's difficult because you, you always want to contribute your own code and add your own versions of stuff. But sometimes you have to hold it back and say, okay, they did it. This whole system is written in one way. I'll just continue uh, uh, in the same way. Any questions so far? <laughs> okay. So let's look at a code. This is, this is not my code. This is a, a piece of code that I took from uh, Guava, actually. Uh, I changed it a little bit, but I'll show you later on what I changed. And uh, the test structure here is very simple. You have the test description on top. You have the, someone defining the future. Then it sets the cancel to true. Then it tries to do future.get. And if it's, it succeeds, it fails. The, the test will fail. Otherwise, uh, otherwise uh, it will catch the exception and uh, assert that the get cause is not null. So this is a very simple structure. And we can see there are three different sections here that, that we can look at. The first one is the startup. We, we start and, and define a set of, 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 of setup for the test. Uh, and afterward, we do something. This is what we actually test. We test future.get. And then we validate that what happened, what should happen, happened. Uh, we, can, we can describe this as a, uh, there are, uh, it's, it's actually two, two of the same thing. It's given, or we set up, uh, how, how, what's the other name? Arrange. Then we act. Then we assert. Or, or, an, or another name for it is given. Given is the setup. When is what we did. And then this is what happened after we did what we did. So this is, this is a very basic structure. And, and we, we aspire when we, when we write, like if this, the, the, the structure is very predictable, where we, we aspire in our tests now, not, not to test the specific details, but we aspire to, to test the, the code behavior. So some people call it BDD, or I'm not, gonna, I'm, I'm not very good in, in all of the buzz, buzz names and stuff like that. But what we try to do when we test stuff, this is one thing that I want you to take away from this talk, is try to test the, the code behavior. Not, not like how it's assembled, but how it behaves. And, and when a test break, it should break because, because it, it, it's not, it, it, because the behavior changed and not because something insignificant changed. And what are, what are the structure pitfalls that we can fall on? So this is actually the full test that I took from Guava. And what, what you see here is that there is a future and then it has a set of asserts, and then we're trying to do the get, and then everything happens here. So when you look at this test, and you have two sections of assertion on it, you think to yourself, well, what is he testing? Is he testing the creation of a new future, or is he testing the future.get? The, the structure is not leading you to understand exactly what, what's being tested here. So, this, for, for example, what I did is just remove the asserts on the previous uh, section ju just to, to be able to understand. Now, once I remove that, if we'll go back to the test that I changed, it, it's clearer for you to see what's being tested. You, the structure is more apparent. And when, when it's written like this, it's, it's a little bit more difficult to, to understand exactly what's being tested. This section, by the way, the fail and the catch, it's, it's a limitation of how Java frameworks are working. But we would want it to see 
uh, uh, even that section where it's wrapped with catch and all that, it's, it, makes us, it makes it a little bit more difficult to understand what we're testing. But we'll get, we'll get to those areas a little bit later. Uh, another pitfall, this is actually a test that's being written in Wix. And uh, I actually signaled here that what we're actually testing is here, is log event. But when you look at the test in the first look, you go, okay, he's testing the recording studio. He's not even testing the, the log event. And then he does something and then he matches it. And there is uh, some data that he's matching that I don't even know where it came from. And uh, when I actually start to understand, I wanted to look at this test and understand it, I realized that log event is doing stuff with those variables on the top, on the, on the right. And, uh, and the test was, someone was trying, because the log action was doing so many things, he was trying to hide it to make it more apparent, to make it more readable. But when he did that, he'd hid too much data. And when you hide too much data, then people who start to who try to read it have, very, have, have a very, very bad day by trying to understand what, you, what you're trying to say there. Um, in the next section, by the way, uh, I wrote a, a test that does, uh, this is me not knowing to draw any diagrams. <laughs> so uh, we have a server that has some repository and it will send an, an email to a, another system. This is a very, uh, a very simple system. This is the code that I wrote. I coded, I, I wrote it as is. I didn't refactor it and I'm gonna refactor it with you along with uh, some of the data, some of the tips that I can give you about refactoring. Any questions so far? Great. <laughs> uh, so let's create a new test. We created a new test. Uh, and the first thing that we write when we create a new test uh, is the test description. It's the name of the test. It describes what it does. Um, the only tip I can give here is, first of all, Use plain English, it's, it's, a very, uh, it's, it's, it's a very simple tip, but uh, I was in system that people wrote every variable and everything in Hebrew English, uh, and I'm, I'm sure there are some systems that, that people also were there and saw that, but the problem is that uh, if you don't write in English and if you don't write it plain so other people will understand, then the next people who will come there won't understand what, what you were saying. And, and I'm saying plain just because it's the same, uh, use the simple language, just describe what the thing does and don't try to write code there like uh, this uh, collaborator does, whatever, blah, blah, blah. just write the simplest description that's possible. We're gonna, we're gonna try to, I, I'm gonna show you how, how badly I do in stuff like that and uh, Another thing is when you, naming is actually one of the most difficult part of the, the, the profession. You, you have to find variable names and, and class names and, and stuff like that. It's very difficult. I can only say that find uh, a structure that works for you and keep with it. It's gonna make your life much easier. Like for example, I wrote two uh, descriptions that I did. Throw an exception if user does not exist. That's uh, plain, uh, as plain English as it's possible. And everybody who re reads it knows exactly what this test does. Uh, and also send an email. So I'm always using a specific structure and I just fill in the, the blanks. So if, if we'll go to my code example that I showed, that I told you about earlier, which is here. This is the, this is by the way, this specs two is a testing framework for Scala. Uh, everything that I do here is also applicable on Node. I can actually show you example of me doing the same thing in Node and in, uh, in JavaScript and also in, in Java. Uh, so if we look at a single test, this is uh, the name of the class. A nice, thing, a nice thing that we have in Scala is that we're able to write the, the test description as, as text. This is also uh, in JavaScript. In Java, it's not uh, possible as far as I know, but um, in, in Java, you will have to write like camel cases. Some people uh, uh, write underscore between the words. 
to make it more readable. But um, this is th this is easier for me. This is easier in this framework to to do to write actually plain sentences. So this is actually what I wrote while I was coding it, and uh, when I read it now, it doesn't make any sense to me. Like for example, fail for not existent side ID. Um, I can do a little bit better by saying uh, if this. Uh, should uh, throw an exception if site does not exist. That can be better. Or uh, fail for user ID. Uh, or let's say send mail to site owner. That's something that this is what it does. It send the mail to site owner. So, but we do some a little bit more stuff here. So let's say. Um, Find the user uh, find uh, owner email by site ID and send an email to him. That can be a, 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 a better side uh, a better description. Um, one of the one of the things that I need like. When, when we put a test description, people say, okay, so we have, the, we have the test description. Everybody that reads that description now knows exactly what the test does, and that's great. So we wrote the method, and well, if, if it was great, then we could all go home now, but uh, test description does not compile. So if someone adds a new feature to it, nothing will enforce him to add more description to it. So it's very nice that you update stuff. And by the way, my, even me, I'm, I'm adding stuff and I forget to update the description or I just, I don't, I don't even think about it. And then the test will just show that if, for example, in, this, in, the, in the test that I wrote earlier, the site, um, um, it will also report to BI, to our uh, uh, business information like system and send a log event about it. I will probably add it to the test but I will probably also forget to add it to the test description. And maybe that's just me being lazy, but uh, I saw that happening too many times, and I know that some of you will probably fall in that pitfall. So test description, as good as it gets, uh, it will not save you from, from actually trying to make the code even cleaner. No, I'm, uh, it's a question. What framework are you using? Uh, I'm using, uh, in Wix, we're using Specs too. Uh, back when we started to move from Java to Scala, uh, we, started, uh, we started using with Specs too because it was good. Uh, now I know that there are other testing frameworks, there, there is Scala test in, in uh, Scala. But before that, I think we are using uh, JUnit. Uh, yeah, JUnit usually. Yeah. I'm sorry? Uh, what version of JUnit you use? Because you mentioned that uh, in Java we don't have the same structure. When we use JUnit 5, however, it's not in production right now, but uh, we could use the same things that you point in it. Like. You can, uh, from what I saw in JUnit 5, you can, uh, you can add it as an annotation. Yeah. Not, not in the method name, but, uh, but uh, it's yeah, it's similar. But again, the annotation won't, won't compile as well, right? <laughs> so, oh, I'll give you a t-shirt though. <laughs> I hope it's in the right size. Uh, hey, um, how about uh, Cucumber? Uh, did you hear, uh, hear about it, uh, about this framework? So uh, basically you have a, a features file in which in plain English you uh, explain what are you doing. And then uh, with annotations, you bind the plain English to methods. And actually, that's how you enforce this uh, lock between the method and uh, its description. You enforce it to the method themselves. And what yes. happens if you add another call? Sorry? And you if you add another call to another method and you didn't add that to the description? Um, Nothing happens. You can use uh, these uh, methods uh, just as any Java method. But uh, the thing is that uh, the, the Cucumber API um, 
forms the tests from the features file, not from the sources. So uh, when you when you run this uh, uh, this code, uh, what is um, executed is only what is described in the features file. I, I understand. This is actually part of the. There are also documentation being generated from the code, and from my personal experience, those the more the system change, the more those things goes goes out of sync. Uh, I know I know that I had a, a documentation that I wrote. Like it, it, this is actually why we don't believe in. The, I also don't believe in documentation so much of the code itself, uh, and I, I do need. I, I think that the code needs to document itself. Is the reason that I'm, I'm thinking that because I, when we did, uh, we exposed the REST API to the Wix services, and. I actually sat with uh, another architect in the company and we built this documentation together and we looked at the code and we looked at the documentation and we read the documentation like over and over again and we made it perfect. And after it was perfect, uh, we were so happy and I said like, okay, it was it's great, we did it, now we can publish, we published it. One month later, uh, a guy from the company comes to me and he's, he looks at the, he shows me the documentation and tells me, I, I don't understand what you wrote here. And I, I, I looked at it, and I could, um, couldn't actually understand what I wrote there. And, uh, and when, when I looked at the log to see if anybody changed it, the perfect work that we did a month ago, I realized that nobody touched it. And for some reason, it looked amazing a month ago, and now it doesn't look good. All of those frameworks, all of those things try to make... Uh, and also, by the way, you need to invest a lot of time in, in maintaining... Uh, this connection between the test description and the test code, uh, isn't it? Uh, and I'll show a little bit more uh, uh, tips later on on how you can do it in the code itself that will make it more readable for you. So let's let, we'll continue and see if you you're persuaded. I hope. Um, <laughs> yes, another question. Yeah, and I have a question. Uh, so you're talking about a modification of a test, right? So uh, if you write a method that tests some part of the functionality, why would you add anything to it afterwards? Uh, why? That's simple, because you have product people and people that want more features and... So no, the test. Like, only one method that tests only something small, if, right? If the method does another thing. If, like, if the example. method that is invoked in this yes. in this test. Exactly. Okay, so in the source code, right? Yeah. So in that case, uh, why your test uh, wouldn't fail in that? No, I'm I'm saying the test would fail. I would probably uh, if I want if I want, for example, uh, for every um, payment being uh, I was uh, doing a payment service, and for every payment there is now a new requirement that goes and say uh, you need to also report it to another system that that thing happened. That's a valid scenario. Uh, so I'll write the code, I'll, I will change that code. So now I have pay and now I'll add another uh, mock call. I'll, I'll do a validation. I'll see that everything happened. And then I'll finish and I'll just uh, leave it like this and I won't touch the test description. So nothing actually makes me add that to, to the test description. And but you'll add uh, a method that would test the validation functionality, right? So that the validation functionality is tested, and your uh, previous test, actually he tested not the validation, it tests something else, no, right? I, so I, I didn't explain myself properly. The, I call, I'm testing a, a specific method, yeah. and now that method, it, it did two things, now it needs to do three things. So the test code and the test uh, and the, the production code will reflect will reflect the change, but the the method that the the, the test description, well, I, I might you can always say like I'm very uh, I'm very organized and I, I will always update it, but no, I'm talking that uh, I just personally me I would just create. Uh, three tests for each case for each. Uh, yeah, but it's not a different case. Yeah, for each branch, right? But but it's not a different test. It's the same. It's the same method call. You you added a, an extra functionality to the same call. It's it's not it's not that you're testing a new method. A new method would be in a new test. Or maybe I'm not I'm not getting you. And we'll we'll, we'll talk yeah, about that. Thank you. Bit there, but thanks. Uh, 
So, so when we have, oh, another question. Sorry. I have uh, another question. What do you think about uh, making some uh, methods with uh, package access modifier only for test these methods? I, I'm sorry, I, I'm not sure. I... What do you think uh, about making some methods uh, with uh, package access modifier only to test this method? If I have a method that uh, I don't want to make uh, public and uh, I don't want to make oh. it uh, protected. You, oh, that's, that's a question for, for, for testing later on. I, I can answer it anyway. You, you're saying uh, you want to expose, uh, you had a method inside the class that was protected or private and you want to test it so you make it public just to test it? Did I get it correctly? No, uh, make it not public, make, make it... Uh, make it protected or in a... Package access um, level. Usually, uh, in, in testing, I uh, when you have that scenario, I'm I'm usually uh, I'm I can actually uh, create a, you can create a colla if you need to test something inside. It's kind of a hint for you to maybe you need to take that code and put it in another class and then have that class call it. Make it a collaborator. So, for example, if you have a logging, uh, if you have, if you want to validate that a logging happened, then you create a new class on the side that does logging services, and then you validate that you call the log instead of just exposing the, that specific method. So, if that, that side effect is important enough for you to test it, perhaps it needs to get a more, uh, a better representation in the code. Does it answer it, or... Uh, but I'll, I'll, it's partially answering it, but it's not so related. So we can, t I, I'm, I'm going to be there here later on so I can talk with everybody. Thank you. So after, after we talked, we created the test, and uh, we, 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 uh, we need to actually set up the first stage. This is the, the given part of the, the project. And now uh, we'll, we'll look at some, some things that we can do here. Uh, one thing that I, one test that I, I need, I'm doing when I'm trying to clean the code is that I'm looking at a single test. And if that single test is readable for me and I can understand, can it stand on its own? If I'm looking just at the line of the test and understand exactly what is testing without drilling down and going to other places, then I think I'm in, in a good place. So uh, one thing is that when you try to clean a test or clean a specific, that specific part of code, just think that if someone just looks at that four, five, or ten lines of code that does that test, if he can understand exactly what the test does. This is one thing that we aspire to have. And uh, the, the first thing is that uh, we, when we set up stuff, we want to extract them. So I'm, I'm going to show a little bit example. We, we're talking about uh, a method of a setup uh, when we set up a specific behavior of the setup that we do. For example, uh, and I'll, I'll show an example. But one, okay, I'm sh okay, all right, that doesn't. Uh, I have to exit the presentation mode in order for me to see the code. So, for example, this is, a, this is a setup code, and I want to, like, for example, it shows when you look at this specific test case, like I said, it goes given, when, then. We're talking about this section now, the given part, and if we're looking at this part, this is actually a, a nice way of, uh, of writing expectation from Mokito. Anybody uses Mokito here, Mox? Great. So... Uh, Specs and Scala allows me to write it in a, actually a, a nicer way, but the thing is that uh, this is a little bit more too much verbose for me, and now you can see that I'm calling a specific method and it returns a specific value. So let's try to uh, let's try to extract it in order to, for me to be able to understand that this is part of the setup. So we're going to write a, a small method called given. This is side DAO. We'll just work the, the, the simplest steps. Give us side DAO and it will with uh, site ID returns So 
we can take this specific code and just put it here and have and have it written. We, we're going to refactor it a little bit more, but this is just the first step. Now, when I extract stuff into a method, when you look at this section without actually uh, without understanding, uh, without understanding, you know exactly that this is part of the given part, part of the setup. You don't know exactly what it does, and we'll, we'll update a, a little bit more. But with a very simple change, it's easier for us to understand that this is part of the setup and not something that's related to the test. Uh, naming that method is, is very, uh, usually if you, like I said, I'm trying to, to emphasize that there is a structure here. So I'm using a given at the beginning of the, of the sentence. So people who knows, who looks at the code knows that it's part of the given part. And it contains the, the, the user's DAO that I'm using the collaborator name just for people to know what I'm defining. But, but it's still not good enough. It's if, because, because it doesn't tell me what exactly it does. It gives me a lot of parameter names. It gives me a lot of details. And I want it to be uh, more coherent. So the second uh, thing that I'll do here is describe the behavior that I'm, just a sec. I, I, I just want to finish this uh, small code. And then I'll, give, I'll, I'll answer the question. So anyway, I want to describe the behavior that I'm doing with the users. So in my case, like I said, I aspire to have, to, to, to test, to show more behavior and not what I'm doing. What basically I'm, the behavior that I'm doing here is I'm giving, uh, I'm creating, uh, uh, I'm, I'm defining a, a, a behavior that happens when the site does not exist. So I should have called it uh, given site DAO with, without site, for site ID, okay, just a second, site for site ID. I don't need to show what it returns because this is part of the behavior. In this case, it returns none. By the way, none is kind of like a, uh, optional in Java 8. Do, do you use Java 8 already or uh, uh, do you like it? Because I try to do some of the things in Java 8 and I... <laughs> <laughs> it's awful, yeah. The, the, especially the, the interfaces with the default methods wasn't, uh, wasn't that good. <laughs> so anyway, if I write this now, I can, I can remove this. And now I have only one method that tells me given site DAO without site for. So I'm actually describing the behavior, although we can, we can have a better description maybe uh, that fits uh, uh, your understanding. But again, this gives me less details. Like this, the, at first, when, when you saw something like this, it's very good because most of you are Java developers, then you see this and you go, what the hell is he doing here? Is he calling something, what it does? And then when I hide it in, in, in a, inside a method, it makes things easier for you to read. So if we'll go to other tests like, uh, in this case, we'll have, uh, we have, we're defining uh, for site ID something that returns a user ID. So we can say uh, the given site DAO. I'm, I'm usually using the, the, the collaborator name just to, to be able to have reference to it. And we'll say that uh, it will have uh, with, owner ID site ID and so now I I defined well this is So let's see if the test pass and it's 
So let's see, we, we comment this thing out. And then I, oh, it needs to be. this and now we all the tests are passing again and by the way uh, another thing that we can do uh, that is very useful for us is in case we uh, for example this this behavior is repeating on the last third test that we have so we can now reduce the duplication between them and have just one place that defined that specific behavior. That gives us a lot, of, uh, a lot of flexibility later on when we'll try to update that behavior. Like for example, if the, if the contract between a, a, non, a, a, a connection between a site and a user ID is being changed, I need to change it just in one place. And and let's continue with more things that we, we can say about this section. Sure, yeah. I'll accept that. Okay, can you hear me? <clears throat> yeah. So my question is, uh, do you think it is re required to um, extract this uh, logic into a separate method, even if it contains only one uh, line of code, and actually in it you can read and actually the same thing that it's given the method that returns in such case so don't you think that uh, it ha it makes a sense if you have a little bit more code and some maybe some um, a few statements of uh, when uh, of given that's that's actually a very good question first of all should uh, you know by uncle bob what the size of a method should be yeah. smaller than this <laughs> So one line is actually, I, I like one-liners, but um, in some places, in so, sometimes, that behavior will be represented by accessing, by doing several actions. But in this case, the, because it's a, it's a unit test, and it's very, very simple for, to, to uh, and you define that behavior in a, in a very simple manner, then it's just one line. For example, if, when you do integration tests, and uh, let's say that I need to create a new user, and then I have to create a new user in the system. So the behavior might be register that email and then do this and then do that, but the behavior itself is just create a new user. So in that case, that method would contain more logic. And by the way, those given methods in, in some scenarios can merge into a single one that describe the behavior that you are testing. This is what I'm trying to do is, is define the behavior. Yeah, I heard that uh, people in functional testing li like to uh, create uh, frameworks for uh, testing purposes, like to, to log in, to do something else, like to use it in all other tests. Yeah. Like to create a framework. Yeah. Uh, uh, Thank create, you. Uh, create your own framework? Yeah. We'll like, yeah, testing framework. Uh, that's actually, we'll, we'll get to that, but you, I think you got a t-shirt. <laughs> Uh, so the, the, the another tip is that, that I can give is that you can reverse the, the, the order of the parameters. It sounds, uh, but, but the reason that I want to do that is this because in this method I cannot reverse because it's just one. But in this case, uh, the thing that is more actually reversed by mistake but the thing that most interesting here is that user ID is the more important part and not the site ID. So if I'm, if I'm reversing it, it's, I need to probably rename the method given DAO with, yeah, user ID for that specific site ID. So if we'll do it on, on, on this one, for example, what is more interesting in here is that for users DAO, uh, I, uh, I want to, the more interesting part that I have is this. This is what's interesting for me. I'm more interested in what I'm returning than what I'm calling. And the, the order of the parameters as I see it here, uh, if I'm extracting it into a method, 
then it's going to be uh, it's going to be in the opposite direction that we actually understand when we read code the thing that appears first is the more important so if we'll do uh, a method for this this part is then it will look like uh, given users DAO with user data user ID and then we have here, and now if we'll go to this section and put this and that, now when you read it, you understand that what's more interesting is this part. It's not, it's not the user ID that is more important. And when you call this one, you know, so, so basically reversing the number, the, the order of the parameters allows someone who reads that code, that sentence, to actually understand what's more important. Because we are very, we wanna push forward and we're not, not interested in reading more than we have to. So this is, this eliminated, and by the way, when you look now at those tests, it's, it's easier, like for example, this one would go, if we talk like earlier, if we mentioned, this would be given users DAO without user for and now it would look something like this. So when you read now this method, first of all, look, look at those, that, those small changes. Now when you look at the code, it's very understandable what the structure is. It's very understandable that, that this is part of the setup method. Because uh, in some areas, in some tests, I can, I can look some code up, but if you're writing DAO tests, for example, that insert something into the database, then you don't have mocks. So basically, if, you, if you're doing a test that does insert something, and then you check that, that select by ID works, then you're calling the same API twice. You're calling insert API and then get by ID, for example. And when you do that, uh, to the same, uh, in our case, uh, it's like user mail or service, then you have like your own DAO and, and you call two methods in it. It's kind of, it's a little bit dif difficult for someone who reads the test to understand what you're te testing. Is it the insert or the select by ID? So when you pack stuff into a given method or, or a specific method outside, it's very, very simple. Uh, it's very simple to understand that this is part of the setup. And, and, when, and the more we refactor, you'll see more. This is just one section. Uh, another thing that I can say well, is that parameter names is important, are important, and you can play with them. N what I'm showing to you right now is something that you can do in, in Scala, although in Java, in Java, I think parameter names are not part of the, part of the you cannot, rely on them the same way like in Scala. But still, I think IntelliJ start, started in the last couple of versions uh, uh, to embed the parameter names into the method. So it, it, you can actually, if you're using IntelliJ, uh, do it the same way. But the way that I'm doing it is that I'm distinguishing between the value that I return by using parameter names. For, for example, uh, given user DAO with user data and Instead of calling it user ID, I will just call it for user ID. And now, uh, and this, in this case, I would call it for site ID. And I can, 
I can, in, in these cases, I can do actually, uh, I can write the parameter names inside the method. So it's going to be foresight ID and And in here, it's going to be for user ID. So now when you look at this method, you go, OK, this is the, the more important part that I'm returning. And this is the key that I'm using. And in some cases where you have, uh, I have other systems where I have um, the key itself is not just site ID. It's site ID and a couple more parameters. If you're using the, the, method na the parameter names wisely, someone who reads it knows exactly which section is returned and which section is being the, the key itself. So this is something that you can also play around and see if it makes your code more, a little bit more readable. And let's see, so let's get turned to the presentation and And th this all dwells down to, to this sentence. We are actually trying to, to test, to, de to describe in the code what we're testing and not how we test in it. To the, the, the behavior of, of user, uh, like for example, in the, in the, in, okay, this is, this doesn't look good. <laughs> uh, for example, in the, For example, in this part where we said, where like, when we said that user DAO without user for user ID, uh, and inside we, we, we hide that it returns none. None is optional for, uh, for nothing. And for example, if I was using Java or I was using something else, perhaps it was returning null instead. Uh, so th that implementation is not being reflected in the test. And for example, if tomorrow I would want to change that behavior when, when we're talking about user DAO, for example, I would say that user that does not exist won't return none anymore, it would return zero, then I won't have to change the test code itself, I can just change the collaborators. The, the behavior itself is not being, it's not being changed, but, but the, the way that we represent them in the code is a little bit different now. And I'll, another another uh, section that we can we didn't finish to, to re refactor the uh, we want to simplify the test. So one thing that uh, actually this this sentence always brings out uh, a lot of people don't don't actually like to see that sentence, but uh, I don't want to see I, prefer, I I personally don't like to see concrete values inside the test. So if, if, for example, in our code, the, the, I had a specific email, I, I put it in, inside a variable already, and I called it some email dot. Uh, so if, for example, I would give, I would do something like this, then when you read this test, you see that uh, it has some email at example.com. And in that specific case, if you put it inside the test, someone might think that some email dot example dot com, uh, at, at example.com might mean something. If you have a, a, a function name that, if you have a, something that returns a value of five and you go puts, and you put five in your test, then the next person who will come there, or you will come there after two weeks and you won't remember why you did it, you won't understand why five is there. Maybe five has some significance. Maybe uh, if I was, like I'm doing always, I would do copy-paste of stuff. I would do something, I don't know, like something like admin at wix.com and just, I was just using it as just a simple email and then someone else who looks at it may, might think that admin maybe has some, some meaning in the code. So what I'm suggesting in this part is not using the concrete value in the test, but put it inside a variable, and the variable describe what you are testing, what this email. So I, I just put user email in it, and then it's very obvious to you when you read it that user email is just a user email. 
I could even call it some user email or yeah uh, what do you do when you have uh, more complicated data to test some integration for example a big XML or JSON um, well what do you do you put it, well, it depends. Uh, it's like it's a, it's a very. How do I generate the data? How do I? I'm I'm not even sure. Uh, it's like if you have a JSON, you can actually. I, I think I can answer your question. Uh, so in this case, um, it, uh, the speaker says, "Sorry, I forget your name." Noam. <laughs> uh, Noam. Yeah. No, yeah, he says that in case uh, if uh, you're not testing the functionality that depends on the user email, it should be uh, it shouldn't uh, be hard coded in your code, right? Yeah. It should be in the uh, in a constant so that uh, the reader of the code will see that it's just some um, uh, some s uh, random email. It's not it's not a testing of some situation. That depends on this email. So, did and I answer your question? No, sorry. Uh, so, I, I think. Thank I, I you, but uh, no. If you uh, have integration with uh, some system and uh, complicated sample of input data, a concrete. I can't. Uh, what can do you do I, with it? I, I usually, um, you know what? I, I can give you a, a short example. Like, if I have, I don't know, some mapper. Uh, oh, just a second. I have a mapper and I want to test that it's, that it's uh, you listen to me? <laughs> if I have a, I'm doing um, a test that test a mapper, for example, and I want it to be, uh, uh, to deserialize some object, uh, just a sec, I want it to, Deserialize an object, a JSON object that has property A and B. And then uh, after I wrote that specific test, I wanted to test something like a, a malformed JSON. So if I'm testing a malformed JSON, I might do something like this and then uh, uh, expect, it, uh, expect the, the, the code to fail. So instead of writing this, I would just put this in a variable that says malformed JSON, and then and then I'll I'll just use the I'll I'll just use that specific variable inside the test. How to generate data that is more complex? It's it well you just generate the data, but but the the variable itself can describe what they're containing. This is actually the, this section, this, what I'm saying in this section. Because if you, if for example, if I'm taking the malformed JSON example as a, as a sample, and for some reason, Jackson now supports that specific format, and now that test won't fail or pass, uh, uh, that test would fail, then nobody would understand why I chose this specific, specific example. But if you see a test fail for this because it wasn't failing on the malformed exception, then you, you know exactly what I put in that specific variable. Yeah. Uh, may I proceed with, with a question? How will you describe uh, connections between uh, data? For example, if you continue with this example, you have a service that extracts value of uh, field A from the JSON. And you need to describe input and output. Input uh, that you give and expected output. And this is connected pieces of data. Uh, it's kind of, a, well, I'll get to it a little bit later on. But the connection that you see between those things is that now you have user ID here and you know it's being returned here. This is kind of how I describe the connection between those two. It's the, the variables connect inside that test. To, 
two, two different variables, then, uh, well, it's a, it's a little bit, it's an example, I, I, it's, it's gonna be a little bit difficult for me to explain, but sometimes, I, I, this is a Scala thing although, but I can do, if, in here I create, it's, it's actually a more complex object because it contains those two, uh, those two uh, variables, but, uh, how do I, uh, it's, it's hard for me to find a, an example, but I, uh, let's talk later on and I'll, I'll see if I can. So, uh, the second thing that we, s we can say about this is that uh, when we look at a specific code, we want to reduce the number of, of, of moving parts. We want to have just the value, uh, the, just the, the things that are more interesting in the code and not show too much information in it. So if, if we look at this code and we see that uh, here we put, uh, we wrap the user ID with something, we can actually remove that. So let's just do the, the same part in the code here and just remove this from here and so now so now this this method call looks a little bit more simpler because it doesn't do anything it, do, it doesn't do another extra thing and in this section we have some user ID and user email let's rewrite it to be more readable so we want it to be with user email for user ID and let's rename this one uh, for, for site ID and user ID, and now we're gonna do, we're gonna move this whole part, whole section, and s here, and now if we look at this one, I, ch I, I did a couple of things here, so user ID for site ID and now when you look at, at this part, you know that what's more interesting in this section is the user email. The site ID and the user ID are the key that allows us to retrieve that. So we simplify that by removing more and more parts from this, this part of the code. And this, this makes things easier for you to understand when you go into this code again. So, I'll, I'll see that, uh, how much, I, I hope I'm not taking too, many, too much time, but uh, the last tip on this car, in this side is that do not move any important part of the logic outside the test. A lot of uh, people, a, a lot of times you have uh, a test that does, uh, for example, for each test case, you define, I don't know, you uh, create a site. For example, I had like, I would have five or 10 different uh, test cases that, that all of them starts with the same, uh, the same statement saying, define a site, create a new site for, for uh, an, a specific owner. And then you look at the code and you go like, okay, it happens all the time, I'll just call it in, before, in the before section of the test. But this is something that you're being tempted to do. But if you do that, then people who that would read the test would not know that you do that anymore because this is outside of the test scope. So you hid too much data. And while cleaning stuff, you, you might clean it a little bit too much and then people would forget that you actually need to define that. So I, I urge you not to do that. And uh, the last thing is, is that once, I think this is, was, it was the, the question that someone asked me before, is when you build this whole, uh, this whole setup methods and all those given methods, 
you can extract drivers from it. You can extract, you can pack them all in a single file that had, defines the behavior that you expect from that collaborator, but it would make uh, things easier for you. This is, by the way, the part, uh, this is the part where I uh, tried to use uh, Java 8 uh, interfaces and I, I, it, it behaved a little bit different than Scala. But if, if I'm going with my tips and I'll extract now the, the thing. So for example, in this case, I had uh, users DAO and it had uh, some code in it and uh, some uh, things that I defined about it is like those two and I have site for those two. So I can create uh, I can create a, a different class that packs all of them and just move them all together. Uh, site DAO test support and users DAO test support. And I will just move uh, all of those methods to it. So if I'm, if I'm moving all of, all of those, And I'll also move the side DAO things to it as well. And now, and now when And now uh, everything would be, uh, uh, it, w it will allow me to, to see exactly once I did, once I pack all of the system in those tiny traits uh, or interfaces or classes uh, in Java, it would be is much more easier to do it in, in a different class, then it's going to be easier for people to understand what, that, what user DAO is expected to return. So, and if you want to change it, it would be easier for you because everything would be in the same spot. And any question about this, by the way? Sure. Uh, hi, so uh, my question is about, uh, if you talk about Uncle Bob, he, <laughs> Uh, his main rule is Bascout rule, so always left code cleaner before as before. Voice cut. Yeah. Uh, so and when we change, as you show us previously, for example, I know how to work that how work in the test. I all my colleagues know how to work, but some newcomer come and hear it book about patterns or something like that and change all. All tests works, but when I open, I need some time to read to understand how it works. And do we need to use that rule? Do we need to change and improve every, um, improve the code every day or every time when we open class? Or if it's work, let it work. I think this is relates to the the comment that I said at first is is that to be consistent is that some, someone goes and try to change the way that you, you work so far. And as I, I, the only good advice, like I, I personally think that you, everything should improve. But in some 
in some things, if it's a group and somebody new comes and wants to change stuff, I would do like a group meeting and try to see uh, what's, what's acceptable with the team. Because uh, it's, it's not all, it's not so related to, to the Boy Scout rule in a way that, well, you want to clean stuff and it's a good thing. But, uh, but it's more related to the way that the other team know it works. And if the other team works in a specific way, sometimes you have, like I said, you have to pull back and say, okay, this is more readable for other people than I don't want to change everything. I would try to show them that the way that I'm going to and, and try to convince them. And if they understand the structure and, and won't have too many comments on it, as a group, I would go and, and start to change stuff. Do I have to do it now for all of the tests? That's the bigger question. <laughs> it depends on how much energy do you have. Yeah. Um, I have a small question. Um, sometimes a big project uh, where uh, a lot of people uh, works on it uh, have situations when uh, some pieces of code uh, uh, beca uh, became unusable. And the only one place that uses this method is only test for for this method. So, so lack do, of do you have practi practical solution how to check to find uh, these dead places and to clean our codes to keep our project clean uh, and uh, remove uh, this this dead places. So, so the, uh, this is actually it's more related to legacy code. If you have a, a part of the system which is like I said, it's not covered by test and you, you're afraid to touch it, it's, it, first of all, it's like one of the biggest challenges. Even in Wix, uh, we actually grew like the, the whole test-driven and all uh, test-driven movement in our company. It, a lot of people came to Wix. I'm one of them that never wrote any tests before because that, that's like a QA job. I'm not going to do that or, or, or whatever excuses we had. I actually, I think that I wrote... Uh, uh, the, the definition of how much test I would write, it would be enough tests for the, my boss to get off my back. This is actually what, how I defined it. Uh, and the way that it's recommended to do is if it's working in a specific, uh, in, in that way, then uh, if nobody needs to modify the code, then it's okay, just don't touch it, leave it as it is. And uh, when you write new functionality into it, you have to, uh, then you have to, uh, you'll add more and more tests. And uh, some, some people actually, when, when, when the area that you talk about is, is so badly written and untested, they actually rewrite it on the side and then move gradually to it. And this is actually one of the tests uh, I said about a bad, uh, how is the, your code good, is how many people want to rewrite it. If, if a lot of people want to rewrite it, then it's, Probably not that good. So, uh, how much time do I have left, by the way? Because uh, I need to... 20 minutes. 20 minutes? Yeah. So let's try to uh, pick up the pace. <laughs> uh, I think this, is, this is answers also what your question. When is a good time to start? The, the, the answer is, I think now. Because in, in some, even, even uh, I, I showed those, some of the methods and some of the things that I do, and then people told me like, oh, this is a trait with just uh, one-liners. Uh, it has like five lines in it. Why are you doing it now? You're, uh, it's a premature optimization. And my answer was, is that if you start early, it's gonna be easier for you later on. Because usually if you wait for a later stage, then that class, like the driver that, uh, that we have here that has, this is the size of it, it's very, very small, uh, then uh, if everything would be in a test or in, in just one class, then it, go, it grows and grows and grows and grows, and then suddenly it's not 10 lines long, it's 150 lines long, and then that's the time to actually, okay, now is the time to clean it, but well, that's 150 lines of code. I'm not going to touch that. That's too risky now. So I would say start early uh, uh, because, because the minute you understand that you need to clean that uh, is, the, is actually, it probably is going to be too late. Yeah. But I have to cut down on the questions because... <laughs> uh, 
where to start if you uh, working on a legacy project that doesn't have test at all? Where to start? How where to best best approach? The, the best approach the best approach is just to add tests for the new functionality. This is this is the and and then gradually the more you work on that system, the coverage will grow and grow. And th this is the only but but this is a very well it's a it's a very problematic. Uh, yeah. Uh, hi, uh, I just have a question. Uh, during our work, we face with uh, uh, lots of uh, um, algorithms that solves different NP complete uh, tasks, and uh, we have different heuristics. So, uh, I so I wonder if it is worth uh, doing uh, some tests uh, during uh, of this algorithm. Uh, um, but uh, this algorithm has different magic numbers just to, uh, to, to, to make uh, the number of combinations uh, a bit less. But uh, at, uh, at any time of the project, these uh, magic numbers can be changed and the behavior can be changed. So uh, if uh, it was so, what should we test? Actually, I understand too, too, too many. Uh, there were too many questions. <laughs> uh, uh, one of the, those magic numbers. Uh, first of all, it's. Uh, I think that when I said about variable names, those magic numbers is, is something that needs to be described in the tests. First of all, in a way that uh, that makes sense for other people. Because if they keep continually changing, then you probably need to how, somehow signal it to someone to know that they can change and what their meaning is. Uh, and how do you test, the other question was how do you test more, uh, the, all of the permutations, or I... <laughs> yeah, so, uh, the result can be different depending on this uh, magic number. So, um, for example, if it's a different range, uh, and the, the, the whole result can be checked uh, uh, only in the equation test. I'm, I'm not sure I, I'm able to answer right now, when, but I'm gl be glad to talk to you later on. But, but what you're describing is that some things that you need to change more and, and change a lot s usually implies that something is not written as good as it should. Because if your test, if you need to constantly update the tests to, to test uh, for every thing that you change, then uh, the test becomes a burden and you actually you spend a lot of time on maintaining them and uh, a good test doesn't need a lot of maintain, maintaining but uh, uh, catch me out later on I, 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 hope, I hope I can give you some more tips uh, the, the next section is going to be a little bit shorter I hope uh, let's okay now yeah uh, the, the next part is the part where we actually test the code. This is going to be a very short section. Uh, the, 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 the when part, the, the, what we're testing actually. Uh, and uh, I would say that you should probably try to make it just one statement. Don't have a test, the, uh, test call that calls too many, uh, too many functions. The, for example, the, the bad example that I gave you before with the log event probably had more than one line, and this actually made them try to extract it. But uh, usually I, I, I don't stumble across uh, cases like this, but this can happen, so try to reduce that. And another thing is don't hide it like they did with the log event example. When you, have, uh, when you are testing a specific code, Make sure that it's visible for everybody to see what you're testing. The API that they're calling should be visible. And if you hide it inside a method or inside something else, that would throw off a lot of people when they try to read the code.
uh, that, so basically I don't have to do anything in my example because it's I'm, I just don't I'm not going to hide it in any other place. Uh, and the last part that we're going to talk about is the expectation. The part that we did the whole uh, show for it. Uh, we we are organized, we started the environment, we, we set up the mocks and everything, but now we have to test exactly what happens. So, uh, matchers, why? Do you know, any, anybody use matchers here? Oh, great. <laughs> uh, Hamcrest? Okay. Uh, so, when you write good matchers, why use matchers? Not all of you are using matches, so I still have, uh, I can talk about that slide. Uh, it's, it makes things more readable, and uh, it also, uh, it also makes uh, better failure messages at times. We'll, we'll get to that. And it's also, it allows you to reuse more matches in, in other way, uh, uh, to reuse them in other section of the test. So if you write matchers that test a specific thing in the unit test, you can actually use the same matchers in the integration test. And, and um, there are some matcher libraries uh, like uh, Hamcrest for Java, like you know, uh, Chai in JavaScript. Uh, well, I don't, ha I don't have a lot of Node people, so you should check it out if you, it's, it's not so extensible as it is in, in, in other, Things uh, and also they're in specs too and in Scala test they have uh, very good matcher libraries. I'm sorry. Um, but what what do we want to do when we when we use matchers? Uh, I'm trying to use just one matcher, not because if you have um, if you have a case where uh, you use Let's see if I can, I can, you know, I, I'll just do the refactoring in one, si in one time. If you have just one matcher, then it defines, you, you're forced to define the whole meaning of what you're matching. If you're doing, like, for example, you see a lot of uh, those issues with asserts. You have someone asserting uh, uh, this variable, this variable, this variable. So if you have, like, a list of asserts, but you don't know exactly what their, mean what their meaning is, in a single, uh, as, as a whole together. If, if we, oh, well, that example is, a far, is, is before, is, is, is like, for example, in the Guava future, he tested that the future is cancelable and a couple of other flags, but this whole thing can be, can dwell down into just a specific uh, one matcher. And if you're trying to compress your matchers into a single one, then it will, in the end, it will push you in a way that that matcher would be more specific and, and will tell you exactly the behavior. I, I'll just finish those slides and then answer some more questions. Uh, another thing is when you choose the matcher, uh, you should describe what the matcher does and how, not how it matches it. Like for example, not use five matching uh, tests, five asserts, and, and then uh, th at the end just uh, have someone try to figure out what it is. And uh, in this section, don't define any new variables. All of the variables that need to be matched should appear in previous versions. As, as, a, as a guideline, you, you, you should only use what you defined in the tests. If someone asked me earlier, I think about the variables and stuff like that, the variables, when you look at a single test, it should have a connection between the variables. So if we, if we Sorry. If we look at, at some code in this in this section, I, I also use matcher in it. So, for example, I I'm using uh, 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 some server that I start up, and I'm checking that uh, like after I send the email, I'm checking that it didn't receive any mails. So this is how I'm testing it. I'm saying that recorded request is empty, it doesn't have any requests in it. But this is the way that I know that the mail wasn't sent. I would want to write something like, mail server must not have any requests. And if, if I look at, at this matcher, 
versus this matcher, then it would be more obvious for people to see what I'm matching because the previous version is an implementation detail because the recorded request is an internal member of my mail mock server and uh, I don't want people to wonder. It's like it has too many details here for people to wonder. And when you read something like this, it's gonna be easier for you to understand. But and another thing is, is that I have a matcher here that validates that a, a mail was actually sent. So it has mail server must receive any request that, uh, that is, well, this is a long line for this. Uh, so this, this, this statement actually validates that an email was sent, but if I'll have to write the matcher to it, I would do mail server must have, how did I call it earlier? Have any request, have mail sent, have received an email of, and then I would put this section here, and now when someone reads it, it doesn't know how, how I'm getting the emails from the mail server, because he doesn't care, it doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything when it comes to the test. Uh, I'm not sure I have enough time to write the matchers, but uh, I'll, I'll continue with, uh, with one last tip, and then I'll conclude, and then we can talk a little bit more, is, uh, failure messages. This is actually a failure message for my test. And uh, one thing that I, I, I wanted to, to emphasize with this is that when something fails, make sure it tells you exactly what failed. Like for example, you see here, uh, this is what expected and this is what actual. I'm using random things for my test. And th something is different here. And sometimes that object can be, uh, can have like 10 different properties. And then I'm, to actually understand what is different is, is it's a mess and it takes me a while. I actually, uh, couldn't, I, I have just one of my pull request uh, update, uh, merge into specs too that, uh, that fixes this and it's gonna be, I, I wanted to, to show it to you but uh, I had some problem uh, upgrading my uh, test samples to uh, the latest version. But the latest version would actually take that specific thing and will dismantle it and tell you just which property changed to another property. But again, when something fails, it, if it fails in a way that means something, then it's gonna be easier for someone to understand why, why it failed when it changed another feature. And sometimes when we fix, uh, when we write code, I would, I would say that the, the way that I'm writing code is that I, I wanna write the feature, so I'm writing the test to it, I implement the code, then I'm refactoring the code, then I'm saying, okay, I'm, I'm done, it's, everything is working, now I have to consider the other feature and then I'm leaving stuff behind. But the failure message is very, very important. If the failure message is not good enough, then the next guy that would, uh, would fail the test for some reason. Like if, if the, this is like a publish request is different from the other publish request and uh, it just, uh, it's closed instead of an open one. So I would say I couldn't find any open request with that ID. If I would see that message or, or I, I couldn't find a, 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 a publish request open but I found a closed one, that would be even better because someone who would understand it say like, okay, the, the request was closed, he can understand what the close, what the, the, what failed. So this is actually the last tip and I'll conclude and then we'll have some more questions. So uh, try to test behavior and not the code on each section. Uh, test each test case should, should, should be readable on its own. And I think this is one of the best startup point that you can have when you try to clean a test. 
is try to look at it alone, just cover the other section of the screen and try to see if, it's, it's, it's un, it, if, if it makes sense to you. Uh, describe on each section, describe what you are testing and not how you do it. The, 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 the behavior of that specific uh, service or method is, doesn't make any, any sense unless you describe it. And start today, not tomorrow, not in a week, not when we'll have time when the project... <laughs> what was that? <laughs> yeah, the, guy, <laughs> the God is angry today. <laughs> but really, start today. If you start today, it's going to be easier for you the next day. If you start later on, it's going to be more difficult. And the last section is use variables you defined in the tests. And that's, that's the end of like, this talk. Uh, and if I'll have more time, I'll just accept questions. Uh, I was the first one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, for the previous section. Um, actually, I have quite sophisticated question. Um, tests themselves, basically, they are code as well. So if we are doing it more or less, we are lucky once we are not supporting legacy system, we are doing more or less TDD or something like that, or BDD or whatever, um, then we are assuming that we are testing right things. So we started our development based on assumptions that we are testing some features, functionality, exactly what is written in the inclusion item. But as the any code, test code, contains bugs as well. There is one very, very nice statement in the book of Sir uh, Ken Beck regarding extreme programming, which says that never trust the code that you've never seen read. Um, so basically the question is, what are the practices that you do use, or probably have some, you know, concrete observations or experience um, in the automatic way of, let's say, breaking tests or writing some sophisticated edge cases, or probably using some interesting, let's say, data sets and parameterized tests? So, what techniques would you recommend to use to see that test being read? and the expected red way. This is the first part of the question. <laughs> uh, yeah, and we'll see whether I have time for the second part. So, so the first part is how do you fail a test? I, I don't think it should be something uh, complicated. Uh, yeah, it's, it, to find like specific edge cases, and usually when you test like very small stuff, it's very, very obvious how to fail them. It's like the only tip I can give you in this section is like just make it when they fail, know that they fail because of this and not because of something else. But uh, there are some sections, there are some people who use property-based testing. I specifically, and by the way, I'm not, like not most of the people in the company does that. I'm using random values for everything, so I'm kind of doing like property-based testing, but just for one, one specific uh, uh, input. But uh, I tried property-based, uh, like to, to convert my code to property-based testing is just adding the, like a line or something. But I couldn't find any value in just testing a random list of 100 values. I just saw that it, it, I, it couldn't, it barely found uh, uh, issues with it. Uh, uh, and I, uh, it just took too much time to execute. So to find specific edge cases, I would say, Try to make your code simpler so you won't have to think too much about the, the, those uh, specific. Like if you have, I think someone asked before about if it's something is uh, protect, you need to convert a, a private method into a protected. Then you, you just r rip it out of this code, move it to another thing, then test that specific thing individually and throw whatever you want at it. And then you don't have to rebuild the whole environment into it just to get to that specific time where, I don't know, the log gets a null value. And if you don't need to test that deeply, just don't do that. Okay, uh, okay. do you use mutation testing somewhere? Mutation testing? For example, when you have a green test, the framework changes the condition for you that it's invalid anymore, it fails, and then basically, like Pete does, for example, and it reports, okay, I call the your expectation I is, is there. 
I, I call this other work, uh, other people in the company, they do it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, hey, uh, two questions and the pizza is frozen. <laughs> I have a question about matchers, but uh, first of all, I wanted to disagree with you that Java 8 uh, is uh, awful. Um, I think <laughs> I, I, I take it back. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I think it's pretty good. At least it's good enough to not to switch to any JVM language because it, it's really good enough. Uh, and uh, the question itself. Uh, so in Java, we have a problem. Uh, most of the frameworks uh, started to uh, work with. Uh, proxies and for instance uh, when I request an entity from database it gets proxy to me and uh, what I want to do I want to check that uh, the properties of the entity are updated and uh, I can't use actual uh, matching by equals on or so on I can't uh, because I don't know the actual type of uh, the entity and what I do, I simply check has properties. Do you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it's not uh, type safe. And when I change the name of the field, it breaks and it's kind of painful. Uh, so is it solved in this uh, nice framework? Uh, in, uh, so w let me understand. You are getting, uh, you are getting like something like a map or, uh, or uh, you're getting like a... Uh, no, uh, no. It's, what, uh, what are you matching against? What? Because for some, in some cases, uh, you can just try to match it in a later stage, and then you have the type, and then it's going to be easier. But to solve your problem, I would probably just build a matcher that has a type, and inside it, I would do the get property. Yes, I tried to do that, but it's uh, pretty uh, complex. Uh, I have to write matchers for each uh, of the entities I add. For instance, I have entity user which has uh, five fields, and uh, I take it by GPA, uh, and it returns me some projection, so-called, which but is. Which when is it, when is it mapped to uh, an actual type? Why won't you test it in the later stage? But like I said, let's let's talk later on because. <laughs> okay. But yes. Yeah. Okay, let's move this question to discussion after and. Uh, you talk about unit testing, and my question, when we use RLP for wrapping something uh, and we test the things, uh, RLP is not executable uh, for such kind of reason because we point into a specific class. And how you handle this? You, you, use, use, you should use integration. I'm sorry, you said oh, oh, OOP. OOP. Oh. Sorry for you. <laughs> some AOP actually is one of the reasons, some of the things you have to test from the outside. Uh, and if, if you're using AOP, then you have, you have to use integration tests. And this is, by, by the way, I, I personally really liked AOP at the beginning, but uh, I don't like it anymore because, because of those things. Uh, it's, it adds too many magic into the code and uh, it makes it very difficult to test. And then you have to do it from the outside with, and it takes more time. So in this case, that's, yeah. So. Uh, okay. Uh, Noam is here. You can talk with him during our pizza break. And uh, also we have one t-shirt. <laughs> Who wants a t-shirt with small size? <laughs> <laughs> no. Medium, medium size. <laughs> okay. And who asks the questions? Okay. Yeah. And uh, so after the break, I think it will be 25 minutes and so on. We will continue with another topics about internals of JVM. Not, not internals, what's new was in JVM. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hey, man. To ask you, what do you think uh, if you um, if you
Коллеги, пожалуйста, рассаживаемся. Мы через три минуты начинать будем. Ну, видишь, себя все хотят. Давайте рассаживаться, чтобы тут потом долго, долго не сидеть. Занимайте, пожалуйста, места. Я не хочу, как этот Андрей Поруби в Райде там приглашает дорогих шановных коллег, запросить своих коллег, будь ласка, займайте места, проводиться важливое голосование. Давайте мы его еще разив повторим, бо не все коллеги, да, да, бо не все коллеги еще стыгли зайти. Пицца уже закончилась, поэтому я не знаю. Вот. Поэтому... Все, хорошо, давайте начинать. Те, кто хотел сесть, уже сели. Я сейчас тоже Игорю выдам футболочки, которые он будет раздавать. И у нас еще, не забываем, есть две лицензии от JetBrains. И кто в фоне, можете также предложить регаться на епамовской ссылке на розыгрыш призов. Мы это в конце сделаем. Все, передаю слово Игорю. Так, сейчас, секунду. Сюда. Оп. Так. Угу, все. так, для начала хочу сказать спасибо всем, что до сих пор с нами, потому что а, сейчас, секундочку, я не включил. Да. Вроде и так слышно, да? Раз, раз, раз. Слышно, слышно сзади? А микрофон. О, о, отлично. Нормально, да? Так лучше. Еще ближе. Вот спадать. Сейчас, секунду. Раз, раз. Слышно, да? О, отлично. Да, хотел сказать, что спасибо, что вы все с нами до сих пор, уже поздно. Вот, остались. Мне очень приятно. На самом деле, я ожидал, что будет намного меньше людей. Вот, спасибо. Поехали. Давайте знакомиться. Меня зовут Игорь, потому что уже со мной знаком. В общем, я с Java уже работаю действительно давно. Я не просто как Java разработчик, я также исследователь. Мне нравится интересоваться Java смотреть, что в нее там, под капотом, разные библиотеки, фреймворки, изучать ее, исследовать, и так пробовать, и так. Вот. Это мои контакты, хочет, кто хочет со мной связаться, пожалуйста. Я работаю в компании Very Good Group. Мы маленькая продуктовая компания, у нас всего с десятка разработчиков. Вот. Наш американский продукт, мы занимаемся Data Security. Вот. У нас всего где-то с десяток разработчиков, и основные фаундеры находятся Сан-Франциско, вот. у нас нет митингов ради митингов, у нас крутые фреймворки, вот. а чисто такой Silicon Value Experience. Если кому интересно, подходите, я могу рассказать более подробно. Вот. О чем будет мой доклад? Все мы уже давно используем Java 8, Java 8 уже дошла, вышла уже очень давно. Вот. С приходом Java 8 появилось очень много крутых фич, таких дефолт методы, как Lambda, Expression, Stream API, Nascorn, Optional, и так далее. И все мы уже, конечно, ждем Java 9. Java 9 должна уже скоро выйти, я надеюсь. Все мы уже ждем. Кто уже читал релиз ноут и Immigration Guide, что будет Java 9? О, отлично, уже много людей интересуется. Вот. И на самом деле очень много таких мажорных фич выходит с разным релизом Java. Но на самом деле так же самое много и появляется минорных апдейтов, о которых многие разработчики даже не подозревают и не знают. Вот, поэтому сейчас я попытаюсь исправить ситуацию и рассказать вам, что поменялось, какие есть минорные изменения. Вот, давайте начнем с такого простого примера. Смотрите, у нас есть клиент-класс, это Podge, 
объект, в котором есть name, age и list account. Ну и getter и setter это от Lombok. Вот. Я создаю клиента, сечу ему имя, сечу age, а дальше я хочу у этого клиента достать все аккаунты, у amount, у которых больше 100. Вот Кто-то видит здесь ошибку? Что произойдет, если я запущу этот код? Null pointer, правильно. правильно. Будет null pointer, потому что аккаунты не инициализированы. Но на самом деле, что можно сделать? Ну, я сделаю new release. Напишу, как бы, ну и все отлично. Но на самом деле, есть прям сейчас кто такой прям трушный performance инженер, то должно забомбить. Он скажет, ну как это так? Тут же создаться релиз на 10 массивов, в котором будет массив объект на 10 элементов. То есть это как бы нерациональное расходование памяти. Вот. И как можно сделать по-другому? Ну, сделаем lazy аккаунт. То есть будет только, когда я вызываю get accounts, тогда мы создаем наш релиз. Вот, уже нормально. Но вроде бы как мы используем ломбок, да, и мы как бы не хотим вот этот, опять писать этот бойлер код. Мы хотим все-таки опять наши аннотации. Вот. Что нам может дать ломбок? Вот У него в аннотации getter есть lazy атрибут, lazy true. Ну, вроде классно, да? То есть то, что я и хочу. Но давайте посмотрим на самом деле, что нам сгенерирует ломбок. Ну, вот такую вот штуку. В принципе, почти то, что я ожидал. Ну, это, конечно, что синхронайст какой-то, ну, какая-то такая, не знаю, как это сказать, жесть, как по мне. Ну, работает. Вот. Я хочу сейчас познакомить вас с очень классным разработчиком. Он явно классный, потому что он архитект в Oracle. Думаю, ни у кого нет сомнений. Вот. Это Нейсон Рейнольдс. Нейсон Рейнольдс, он архитект в Oracle, он в команде PSR Unity, и он занимается перформансом, код-оптимизацией, реал-тайм-мониторингом. Что сделал этот Нейсон Рейнольдс? Вот. Нейсон Рейнольдс проанализировал 670 химдампов различных Java-приложений. Вот. И он сделал некий анализ, провел и предоставил некие метрики. Он говорит, что самые популярные объекты в P это string, массив char, массив object, array list и hashmap. Кто-то когда анализировал химдампы, используя или JVisual VM, или Eclipse Math Analyzer, то вы наверное, наверняка видели, что там в топе в рейтинге количество объектов всегда там char, или массив object и так далее. Вот. И основываясь на своих анализах, Нейсон говорит, он утверждает, что 20 целых и одна десятая процента использования хипа приходится на коллекции. И он выделяет три проблемы, ключевые, с которыми это связано. Он говорит, что первая проблема – неиспользуемая коллекция. Как в нашем случае, если мы создали new release, то мы потом вообще никогда не вызываем, не используем коллекцию. Вторая проблема – это маленькие коллекции. Он говорит, что очень часто люди для того, чтобы вместо того, чтобы, например, создать в каком-то объекте несколько полей, например, три поля, они создают коллекцию, ложат ее туда. То есть он утверждает, что они как бы не рационально расходованы память. Он говорит, что это одна из самых значимых проблем. И третья проблема – это спарс коллекции. Что такое спарс коллекции? Это коллекции, у которых их объем в два раза больше из тех элементов, которые в ней находятся, используемые. Ну, если просто говорят, вы знаете, что если реалист, если вы добавляете в него элемент, он потом растет. Но если вы удаляете, он не сужается. Ну, здесь там есть метод trim to size, но факт есть факт. Вот. И на основе на его исследованиях в реалисте появились некие изменения с выходом, выходом GDK 1.7.0.40 update. Вот. Теперь смотрите, реалист, видите, по умолчанию. Теперь, ну, если раньше я помню, он был, создавался массив объекта на 10 элементов. Теперь у него пустой массив. Видите, элемент дата равно empty element data. Empty element data это пустой массив. И на самом деле, когда мы вызываем например, метод add, то вызывается метод ensure capacity internal. То есть он что делает? Он тогда уже вырастает, его все равно становится на 10. Как бы ленивая инициализация. Можно так это рассматривать. Ну, понятно, да? Вот. И вот видите, вот этот ensure capacity. Он говорит, что если element data равно empty element data, то мы делаем его capacity минимально, делаем default capacity. И на самом деле, если заметите, видите комментарии у конструктора листа. Это от код Брамс GDK, это не я придумал. Конструктор empty list with initial capacity of 10. 10. То есть ну, на самом деле не 10. Это как раз вот та ситуация, когда код уехал, а комментарий остался. Что еще раз показывает, что такого рода комментарии не очень как бы логично. Но все мы люди и все ошибаются. Вот. И на самом деле эти же, этим же изменениям подвергся и хэшмап. Хэшмапы видим тоже с выходом GDK 1.7.0.40. 
у нас empty table по умолчанию. И когда мы вызываем put, то он проверяет, что если в table равно empty table, то только тогда начинаем inflate table, то есть раздувание нашей, вот нашего массива empty table entries. Вот. И он тогда он же будет нам на 16. Вот. Но GDK 1.8.0.25, они убрали этот пустой массив и сделали not table null. И тогда они проверяют, видите, этот put val вызывается if tab равно null, тогда мы делаем resize. И тогда уже вырастает наш массив. Вот. Поехали дальше. Хэш коллизии. Все мы знаем хэшмап, есть у них коллизии такие. И вот смотрите, тот же клиент, но здесь я заставил number у него поле. Брал name age. Вот. И я выпрямляю метод equals, перепределяю и хэш код. И еще comparable, заметьте. И проявляю compare to. И вот здесь ключевой момент, что я сделал хэш код return 10. Вот. На самом деле это один из тех вопросов, которые я люблю спрашивать на собеседовании. Причем любого возраста, там, возраста и уровня разработчика, то ли ты синер или не ваш. То есть это просто проверка, как человек понимает, что произойдет. Ну или equal сделать return true, что будет тогда. Вот. И кто знает, что будет, кто хочет ответить. Да, все верно. Коллизия будет, все будет в одном баке. Вот. Я создаю мапу, создаю клиентов и ложу туда... 10 клиентов. Видите, это new client, и приду number от 1 до 10. И причем, что не важно, что хэш-код у них всегда будет одинаковый. И передаю как по ключу какие-то строки. Это не имеет значения. Вот. И на самом деле вот такой будет у нас table. Мы видим, что у нас будет тот же массив, и все элементы будут лежать в 10 бакете. И видим, они выстраиваются в список. Ну, как linked list. Вот. И получается у нас теперь сложность от n. Потому что, чтобы нам достучаться, к примеру, к десятому элементу, нужно пробежать от первого до десятого, перебрать по equals. Вот. Это была одна из таких алгоритмических атак на хэшмапу. Когда можно взять хэшмапу и положить, и она будет сделать так, что она будет очень медленно работать. Вот, вот эти единички, цифры, это number клиента, ну понятно. Вот. Но давайте посмотрим, я добавляю одиннадцатый элемент. Делаю клиент 11 и string 11. Что сейчас произойдет? Оп, у нас дерево теперь. Вот, с новой версии GDK у нас теперь будет дерево. Они сделают такую оптимизацию. Причем это красно-черное дерево. То дерево, которое в тресете. Вот. Смотрите. И мы видим, что у нас тот же бакет, на самом деле, десятый бакет. И все элементы также лежат в этом бакете. Просто теперь там не список, а дерево. Теперь сложность уже улучшает. Теперь от логарифм от n. Это понятно, да? Вот. Но мы там помним, что я там имплементировал comparable, и как бы логично, что мы знаем, что reset, map работают на comparable, что им нужно знать, как делать порядок и построение в дереве элементов. То как бы все логично. Я сделал comparable, и нам использовать comparable для того, чтобы понять, где будет находиться элемент в дереве. Но давайте проэкспериментируем, и я уберу имплемент с comparable. Вот. Я уберу, ну как бы, что это да произойдет. Кого какие эти, мы футболочку дадим. Я уже да. показал. Просто есть люди, которые уже знают. Вот, вуаля. На самом деле тоже дерево. Я сразу скажу, что я когда-то с одним из разработчиков в моей команде поспорил насчет того, что все равно будет генерироваться дерево, даже если не будет компарейбла. И выиграл блинчики. Так что вы тоже можете поспорить уже. Давай, может, кто скажет, почему там будет дерево. Да, вот это будет хорошо. Нет. А что значит field? Состояние. Да, а, да то есть один field number, если бы было два, то мы не смогли бы дефолтный compare to метод. Ну, то нет. есть дерева бы не было, да, тогда если у нас да. два field. Да. К сожалению, нет. Что? Есть еще варианты? Арсен? Да, я знаю. Сортировка будет происходить с помощью system identity hash code ага. в данном случае. <смех> давайте посмотрим, правду ли говорит Арсен. Вот. Когда, давайте посмотрим, когда это происходит. Когда вот раз у нас получилось дерево. Вот. Если посмотрим, это кусок кода из метода put, и у нас есть некий флажок 3 fi threshold. Видим 8. Вот. <смех> <смех> да, есть такой флажочек. И на самом деле, когда у нас элементов в одном бакте коллизия больше, чем 8, то он начинает пытаться перестроить его в дерево. Вот, вот такой вот подход. Вот. И как это происходит? Почему? Вот. На самом деле, если есть comparable, то используется comparable. Ну, вроде логично, это как бы очевидно. Вот. Но что происходит, если нет comparable? Вот. 
Тут немножко хитрее, чем сказал Арсен, но в принципе как бы логично. Вот. Смотрите, как это работает. Если два, элемента, два объекта, которые сравниваются по параболе, одного и того же класса, видите, get class, get name, одного и того же, тогда будет использоваться identity hash code. Видите, system identity hash code. И эти hash коды будут сравниваться. Если класс отличается, в нашем случае у нас все там клиенты, тогда у них совпадают имя класса. Тогда будет использоваться class name compare to. Что такое identity hash code? Что это такое? На самом деле identity hash code это нативный метод, но он возвращает нам hash code объекта с класса объекта, вне зависимости от того, переопределили вы hash code или нет. Логично, да? То есть если я переопределил в клиенте hash code, то всегда будет вообще с объекта. Напомню, что hash код с объекта возвращает рандомное число. Почему-то многие разработчики считают, что это адрес. Но нет, это не адрес. Есть некий алгоритм парка Миллера Random Generation, который по умолчанию, он возвращает рандомное число. На самом деле там есть флажок gv-xx hash код, и там 5 у него состояния. От 0 до 5 вы можете поиграться, на самом деле можно сделать, чтобы всегда была константа. Можно сделать адрес. Есть статья на хабре, кому интересно, почитайте. Но не адрес, как все говорят. Это адрес, адрес. Вот, и видите, что я здесь сделал System Identity Hash Code и создал три клиента с одинаковым number. И там их Hash Code всегда был у нас здесь. И все равно вернулись разные. Видите? Вот. Еще самое главное понимать, что Hash Code у объекта Identity, который вот этот вот с объекта, генерируется только один раз у объекта. И он не меняется на всей жизни объекта с приложения. Вот. Ну, что получается? Как бы... Этот identity hash code используется для того, чтобы положить его в дерево. Когда метод put вызывается, там вызывается метод 3.5.bin, вот этот вот, в котором используются эти проверочки, используется identity hash code с методом parable. Как бы все логично. Ну вот я посмотрел метод get, ну то есть как тогда получится, смотрите, какая проблема. Если identity hash code у того у нового клиента, который создал, я его создал с 11, положил его в мапу, да, если identity hash code, он один, число, например, один. Когда я вызываю get и передаю клиента с тем же номером, как бы я ожидаю, уже будет другой identity hash code. Тогда получается, как я, ну, если я положил объект свой в мапу, то я тогда уже никогда его не найду. Логично, потому что хэш-код будет другой, и как мне достать уже объект. Понятно, да, как приблизительно. Вот, и что тогда? Я тогда зашел в метод get, залез, посмотрел. И что происходит? Там вызывается метод find, в котором идут вот проверочки, используется comparable, если implements, а если нет, то он не использует identity hash code. То есть на put он использует эти хеш но чтобы взять его не использует. То есть как-то так <смех> интересно получается, да? Вроде мы положили, использовали, а достать уже не используем. Вот, я на самом деле ну, пошел дальше, мне стало интересно. Вот как оно работает. На самом деле, когда вы вызываете get, то он уже не использует эти хеш и ваше дерево работает как? Он на самом деле перебирает все объекты, проходя через все дерево, начиная это с правого ветки. Видите, если я, например, Делаю get клиенту, у которого два номера, то он возьмет первый, потом возьмет шестой, девятый, восьмой, третий, потом пятый, десятый, одиннадцатый, четвертый, седьмой. То есть он перевернет все элементы. Вот, это, это как бы вопрос получился, нужно ли перебирать comparable или нет. Вот, получается, если вы не перепределите comparable, то у вас получается сложность, может быть, также вот, вот, вот такой нюанс. То есть он перебирает все дерево. А идентичный вот. шкод при этом вообще где-то используется? Нет, он использует только когда положить. Я что же удивился, ну, потому что если его как бы нелогично использовать, потому что смысла, если он всегда будет другой. То есть тогда вот такой вопрос интересен. То есть просто генерим, кладем и... Да, да, и все. То есть мы его просто используем то, чтобы понять, как положить, какое направление у direction. Ну, не стартировать, а понять порядок объекта в дереве. То, что мы используем, куда знать, вправо или влево. Дерево, а? дерево. Дерево. Структура, в которой хранится это дерево, это просто обход. Да, такой. да, и все. Вот. И на самом деле тоже, видите, это красно-черное дерево такое же. Вот. Напомню, что свойство красно-черного, что у него всегда корень черный. У, у красных листьев не может быть красных предков, не листьев, а элементов узла. У, кажд, у каждого красного должны быть черные. И количество от каждого объекта до, до листья черных элементов должно быть одинаково. Если видим, что тут 1, 4, 2, там 1, 5, 1,9. Вот. Ну, то есть оно всегда сбалансировано, потому что от каждого, от корня до самого длинного, глубокого элемента не должно быть больше, чем в два раза, чем от корня до самого маленького, самой веточки маленькой до листа. Ну, то есть это такие как бы, свойства красно-черного дерева, которые обеспечивают нам эту балансировку. Вот. 
Но если вы заметили, кто внимательно смотрел, я говорил, что там есть некий флажочек, который 3, 5, bin, да, и 8. Он. Я говорил, что если больше, чем 8 элементов, коллизия происходит в одном бакете, это начинает перестать. Но в том примере, когда я показывал, то только аж на 11 у нас получилось дерево. Почему так? Ну, вроде бы с 3, 5, если шел флажочек, а дерево все равно на 11. Но вот смотрите, что происходит. Там вступает в игру еще один флажочек, это называется min 3, 5 capacity который равняется 64. Вот смотрите, что происходит. У меня есть та же мапа, те же клиенты, я ложу 8 клиентов. Когда ну, положил 8 штук, у меня еще список. Когда я ложу 9 элемент, то есть уже должен сработать вот этот reify threshold, но туда вступает вот этот reify capacity. Он смотрит, видите, проверочка, вот. Если у нас tab length меньше, чем этот, это capacity, тогда мы делаем resize. То есть он получает сначала делает перерастание, чтобы он, он надеется, что если сейчас мапа перерастет, то уже не будет вот такой вот ужасной коллизии у нас. Но так как я сделал хэш-код сюда 10, то это не помогает. И поэтому смотрите, я добавляю девятый элемент. На данном этапе у меня длина capacity length 16. Видим. Потом добавляю десятый. И, и смотрим, 16 меньше 34? Нет. Тогда он делает resize. Добавляю десятый. Уже он 32. 32 меньше 64? Да, получается. И он делает resize. И когда я уже добавляю 11 элемент, уже length шарно 64, и он смотрит 64 меньше 64? Нет. И тогда уже происходит вот это вырастание в дерево. Понятно, да? Вкратце. То есть он пытается еще как бы некими итерациями сделать resize, чтобы перерасти, чтобы побороться с этой коллизией. Вот. Конкарет хешмапа. Все мы, наверное, знаем конкарную шмапу хорошо, как она работает, используем ее, наверное. Да. Хорошо, объясняю. Зачем identity hash code? Получается, смотрите, когда добавляются объекты, и у них нет comparable. То есть зачем нужен comparable? Comparable нужен для того, чтобы понять направление объекта. То есть как в бинарном дереве работает. Если у вас есть, например, вот у вас есть сначала один элемент, потом приходит шестерка. Шестерка смотрит, она больше единички или меньше? Если больше, идем вправо, а там меньше, идем влево. Но получается, мы должны сравнить с чем-то, что больше или меньше. По какому признаку больше или меньше? И если и нужно взять что-то объекта, чтобы понять. А identity hash code возвращает int, это число. И мы число можем сравнить, можем сравнить у двух объектов и у их числа. А мы могли бы рандом нагенерить влево или направо просто? Ну, в принципе, да, да. Можно было и рандом. Нет, дерево, если у вас будет comparable, тогда все будет хорошо. Тогда он завязает comparable, тогда... Да, тогда не пойдет. О, contribution в GDK. Вот, вот такие вот пироги. Смотрим дальше. Concurrent hash map. В GDK 1.7.0.40... Это та старая шмапа, к которой мы все привыкли, у которой есть concurrency level, который по умолчанию 16. Это тот флажочек или показатель хешмапа, который показывает, сколько будет в ней маленьких хешмапок. Или они называются сегменты. Мы знаем, что concurrent хешмапа внутри себя состоит из многих маленьких хешмапок. Для того, чтобы лучше делать параллелизм. Вот. Она использована сегментов. Знаем, что все операции non-blocking, retrieval операции non-blocking, fail-safe iterator, и основывается она используется на unsafe. То есть под капотом внутри юзается unsafe. Вот. Что такое сегмент? Сегмент это вот у нас наши хэш entry, наши хэш table, то есть маленькие хэш-мапки. Вот, видим. Но в GDK 1.8.0.2.5. Какие изменения получились в concurrent hash map? Сразу скажу, что все эти фокусы с деревом также присутствуют и в concurrent hash map. Это раз. А вторых, больше нет сегментов. Сегменты были удалены. Вот. Ну, не совсем. Покажу. Вот. Теперь используется, получается, нода, только как linked list. Видим, что у нас здесь у класса нод есть next нод. То есть список из нод. Если раньше это были сегменты, то сейчас это список из маленьких хешмапок. Вот. Но сегменты остались только для того, чтобы backward compatibility для сериализации. Они для сериализации оставили. Вот. Скажу, что я пытался разобраться хорошо в новых хардшмапах, как все устоит, но ты всегда упираешься в этот unsafe, 
когда доходишь до unsafe, а дальше уже непонятно. Но в целом скажу, что ну, нужно понимать, что один факт, как многие люди думают, что, например, синхронайз не используется в константном шаппинге. На самом деле используется. Так же, как, например, идет когда перерастание в дерево, вот, например, то используется синхронайз на баке. Вот. И последнее я хочу рассказать про стринг. Вот. Ну и скажу, что про конкарный шмап я так и не, не досилил. А можешь в конкарный хэшмап да. вернуться, пожалуйста? Ага. Вот. А что здесь является объектом блокировки? Ноден. Ноден. Есть table нод, то есть это тот же нод, который был в сегменте. Только раньше они mm -hmm. хранили все объекты, как бы сегмент был у них. То есть лог берется, нода лочится. Да, да, лочится да. нода. Вот, они получают сканово, лочится целая нода, и когда перестанет, все верно. Вот, они просто делают next. Вот, список. Вот. По поводу стринга. Да. Ну смотри, нода это которая есть хэш, кей и вэль. Ну вот. То есть, То есть это как значение. Ну да, можно. И так. получается вместо сегмента теперь блочится просто один нода. Один бакет? Ну, не, не, не ноды, ну как, спи, ну можно сказать, что это свой список, потому что у каждой ноды есть следующая, ссылка на следующую а ноду. Не, 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 там бывает ссылка, когда лочится нода все. Тогда бы не было смысла, тогда лочится у тебя вся хэшмапа, тогда никакого выгода. Я сейчас в этой ноде вижу хэшмап entry. Ну, по сути, получилось то же самое, только раньше это было в сегменте, сейчас это хранится, был массив сегмента, а сейчас это просто есть ноды и ссылка на следующую ноду. Ну, можно параллель провести, что нода это entry или нет? Это и есть, как бы. Мне не видно за головой, я только эту часть вижу. Я к тому, что получается в конкурент хэшмапе прошлых версий блокировка была на несколько нод, сейчас на одну. Так, ну, ну типа того, да. Uh -huh. Я скажу, что я не буду там утверждать точно, как там внутри все устроено, потому что я пытался там осилить, но, во-первых, там код такой, который не очень легко читается. Но... Да, клей пишет. Да, 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 да. Ну, <laughs> да, не будем обсуждать, потому что вы сами понимаете, это структура данных, которая не так просто писать. И по поводу строки. Вот. Также изменения подверглись строк стринг. Класс стринг. Оттуда удалились некие два поля. Offset и count. Если кто знает, вот такой простенький вопрос на собеседовании, как легко создать memory leak. Вот. Memory leak. Утечку памяти. Вот. Ответ простой. Можно создать большую строку до GDK 1.06. Очень огромную. На миллион, например. Элемент. Потом сделать substring из нее и взять там, два или, две или только буквы. И получится, что у вас нет. У вас не будет создаваться новая строка. У вас будет хранить в памяти тот же большая строка. Просто вы извините offset и будет показано два. У вас будет храниться все равно тут большой объем. Вот, они эти убрали флажочки. Вот, сейчас будет создаться новое. Вот. Что хочу сказать. В целом мой был доклад не только рассказать про какие-то новые фичи. В основном это такие знания, которые придется может вам на собеседовании блеснуть знаниями, показать, вот я знаю и так далее. Я хочу как бы, сказать о том, что очень полезно смотреть в исходники, смотреть, что какие изменения подбираются в вашей библиотеке, не только в GDK, а используйте вы какой-то фреймворк, это очень полезно, потому что вдруг вы ищете какую-то уже фичу, и она уже давно уже есть или будет. Вот. Я хочу посоветовать вам посмотреть некие видео. Первое это Java Memory Hox, это Nathan Reinhardt, это те которые исследования, которые он проводил, и он дает некие там советы. Вот. Второй доклад это с DevOps Брайана Гойца, там где он рассказывает, какие фичи в GDK могут появиться. Очень важно, он там очень сильно пытается донести до людей, что не нужно ответить, что вот там это будет такая-то фича крутая. Он просто говорит, что возможно это будет. Вот. Доклад Алексея Шипелева, о чем молчат хипдампы. Очень интересный доклад. Там вы можете посмотреть и найти для себя толзу, как по мере, сколько все-таки весит объект. Вот. Потому что те люди, которые бомбили, у которых говорили, что релиз большой создается, я когда спрашиваю у них, а сколько весит релиз, то ни один из них мне не ответил. Вот. И также хороший доклад Алексея про катахезис стринга. Вот, также полезно. Он там детально рассказывает, каким изменениям подвергся класс стринг. И GDK релиз ноутса. То есть очень важно всем советую, рекомендую читать релиз ноутса. Я их стараюсь регулярно читать с каждым выходом новой версии Java, что в ней поменялось. Там есть какие мажорные изменения, так и минорные. Вот эти изменения, которые сегодня я вам показывал, это входили в состав минорных ченджей. Поэтому мало людей знают о них. И вообще когда-то слышали. Поэтому очень полезно читать релизноутсы. 
Вот. Ну и на этом все. Всем спасибо за внимание. Спасибо за доклад. Очень интересные вещи. Но вот вопрос, зачем такое спрашивать на собеседовании? Очень хороший вопрос. Я считаю, что он человек, который спрашивает такие вот такие прям вообще глубины, неадекват. Потому что, ну, как бы... Я скажу, не, я не спрашиваю там, что с дерева, а если идентичный хэшкод, конечно, нет, упаси Боже. Я спрашиваю там, если хэшкод сделать return 10, а equals true, тогда я четко могу понять, человек понимает, как работает хэшмапа, или он просто выучил, что хэшмапа, ой, equals хэшкод, это рефлексивность, симметричность, непротиворечивость, ла-ла-ла-ла-ла, он заучил. и. Но если как бы... ты спрашиваешь, вы знаете, как Не, я... я я спрашиваю, я, скажу, я говорю, а в Java 8 что там поменялось? Но скажу, что из где-то из 50 человек только вроде один или двое сказали, что там дерево потом появится. Ну это просто как бы для меня это показатель того, человек интересуется Java или нет, читает ли он что-то. Там у Антона Архипова, кто знает такого, да, есть да. хороший доклад про как он, неадекватное интервью. Себе интервью. Вот, там всем очень советую посмотреть. Да, да, тоже очень интересно. А, ну, да? Ну, <laughs> Давайте ну, посмотрим, кто на шестой джаве? Один человек. <laughs> Очень, да, соболе, соболезную. А кто на седьмой еще? <laughs> так если на седьмой до сих пор люди. Ну и на сто... <laughs> не, не, ну это уже... Тарас, ты на пятой? Четвертая? Это жесть. Это как в отпуск, да, на отдых. Как профилактория кого-то на Java 8. Спасибо за доклад. Вопрос касательно identity hash code. Вот была сказана фраза, что в течение всего в течение всего всей программы, исполнения всей программы, хранится хэш код определенного объекта. Заголовки, да. А, да, он конкретно привязан к инстансу класса. Ну, к объекту. К объекту, окей. Это а, то есть, identity hash code, он, он как-то уничтожается когда-либо, или даже если у нас инстанса больше не существует, все равно его хэш-код хранится. Потому что... Не, но ну, если объекта нет, то, скорее всего, он удаляется, потому что он хранится в заголовке объекта. То есть, просто я имею в виду, что если вы создали объект, вызвали identity hash code, вернулся 5. Если вы еще раз вызовете, 5 вернется 5. Да, Рено. Кстати, хочу добавить очень интересный вопрос. Мне нравится, по поводу мы уже говорили про мапу. Вот смотрите, если я делаю с мапы get по какому-либо ключу, и мне возвращается null, то что это значит? Что объект, который лежит по этому ключу null, или объекта нету там? Это такой противоречивый интересный вопрос. Ну вот, потому что на самом деле ответа про нет, потому что нельзя никак понять. Вопрос немножко на другой теме меня всегда интересовало. Но ну, ты все знают, что до 6 Java включительно можно было запустить консольное приложение без метода main. Начиная с 7 Java уже нельзя. Вот э, за счет чего? А кто знает, что до 6 Java можно было консольное приложение без main запустить? Я не знаю, да. Я не слышал такого. Интересно, я даже не знал, спасибо. Видите, я тоже не зря пришел. Снова вопрос на собеседование. Да. Адекватный, самое главное. Да. То есть нет ответа на этот вопрос? У меня нет, к сожалению. Но зато мы знания расширили аудитории. Да, видимо. Так, у кого еще есть вопросы? Какие-то животрепещущие. Там еще, кажется, в какой-то версии нельзя теперь с, в хэшмапу с, ключ, с налом добавлять. Нет, в конкарт хэшмапу нельзя. А, в конкарт. В хэшмапу, там в конкарт нельзя наложить, и кей, и вэль, потому что там падает сразу external pointer. Можете проверить. Я даже, кстати, недавно это проверял. Выпадет. И вроде бы, не знаю насчет хэштейбла, вот этих экзотических, но конкарт хэшмапу точно нельзя наложить. Вот. 
но в обычную она может. Она все-таки говорила о том, что comparable hash map по поведению это все-таки не совсем дерево, это больше похоже на связанный список. Просто оно с... с Когда с без компера было? Ну да, 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 да. получается. Да. Просто интересно, а смысл было переождать э, лист в, в дерево, если он non был Тут напрашивается, собственно, оптимизация, чтобы не смысла Но перестраивать. Не, ну, как бы, да, не знаю, на чем надеяться. Да, просто что вероятность будет, ну, все равно лучше. Да, да. Да, потому что проблема какая, что список всегда по порядку, ну, типа, выстраивается там, выигрывается, и получается, ну, если надо быть последним, а тут намного, ну, как бы, вероятность намного выше, выше да, чуть-чуть да, чуть -чуть выше все равно. Mm -hmm. Ну, да. Ну, это, ну, вот интересно, как получилось. Я сам совершенно не ожидал, что вот, как бы, хэш-код identity используется, но, как, когда ложим объект, а когда достаем, уже не используется. Так, ну, давай футболки кому-то. Кто тут вопросы задавал еще? Кому я ему футболку? Давай мы тебе поменяем на меньший размер на М. А тут кто-то я большой, я помню, задавал. Вот. Ой, давай с Microsoft. Хорошо, тогда еще, да, давайте, кто задавал вопросы и кому нужна лицензия JetBrains? Хорошо. И, и кто еще? Там академическая. А я там не помню. Вопрос. Только лицензия. Только лицензия. Не, не. Хорошо. Ты и... Да, вот здесь я помню вопрос. Хорошо, подойдете к мне. Хорошо, и теперь давайте поблагодарим Игоря за... Вот. Игорь, копай дальше. Ну, глуп. Да, ее добить. И сейчас последнее. Мы сейчас быстренько разыграем от, 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 от ЯПАМа призы. Так что не, не спешите уходить сильно. Да, хотела сделать по-честному, чтобы было видно мой экран, но подключиться не могу, переходника нет. Надеюсь, вы мне поверите на слово. Рандомайзером мы сейчас выберем. И по списку просто первому человеку сумка спортивная, потом две сумки для ноутбука и две кружки. И дарим тем, кому кто дождался конца. Значит, первый Роман э, Масиенко есть такой? Роман Масиенко дождался. Я вас поздравляю, вы сумку спортивную выиграли. И нам. Дмитрий Гринкевич. Есть Дмитрий Гринкевич и Юрий Кравченко. Юрий Кравченко есть? Нет? Что-что? Юрий Харченко, да, я извиняюсь. Да. Это сумки, да. Спортивного да. И две кружки. Иван Лука, извиняюсь, если неправильно, Лука Щук. Есть? Нет? Иван Лукач есть. Угу. И Дмитрий 